Joni Weil, and my gallery here in New York, Gemini GEL at Joni Weil, has been a member of the IFPDA since 1991. And on behalf of the IFPDA, the Prince Center New York, and the Ellsworth Kelly Foundation, I am very pleased to welcome you to this uh, first of many fine programs that are taking place this week during the print fair. Gemini GEL, the Los Angeles-based print printer and publisher, had the privilege of creating over 300 prints and sculptures with um, Ellsworth Kelly. And today's discussion, Ellsworth Kelly's centennial, Focus on Prints, grew out of an exploration of color exhibitions uh, celebrating Ellsworth's centennial, one at Gemini in Los Angeles and one here in New York, as well as the exhibition in the Leslie and Joanna Garfield lobby of the Prince Center New York, which I'm pleased to say is um, my ground floor neighbor on 24th Street. My gallery's exhibition on view through the middle of November would not have been possible without the generous loans courtesy of Jordan Snitzer and the Jordan Snitzer Family Foundation. And I want to publicly thank Jordan for his invaluable cooperation. Uh, furthermore, I would like to acknowledge my Gemini Los Angeles partners present here today, uh, Suzanne Felsen, Anne Grinstein, and my husband, Sidney Felsen, who co-founded Gemini in 1966. <laughs> Sidney has played an integral role, not only in guiding Gemini in its collaborations with artists for the past 57 years, but perhaps more to the point in today's panel, in 1982, he introduced Ellsworth to his husband, Jack Shear. The result of Sidney innocently inviting Ellsworth to accompany him on an errand to Photo Impact, the professional photo lab uh, just a few miles down the road from Gemini and the place where over 25,000 of Sidney's black and white film images of artists at work were processed and printed with Jack's assistance. It was love at first sight and the rest, as the expression goes, is history. Amongst his many talents, Jack excels as a photographer. Yeah, no, true. Uh, Jack excels as a photographer, a curator, and drawings collector. And as the executive director of the Ellsworth Kelly Foundation, he is expertly stewarding Ellsworth's legacy. It's my honor to introduce Jack at this time. Okay, I really hate these introductions. Uh, louder? Excuse me, ladies and gentlemen, we are here for the Ellsworth Kelly Centennial Focus on Prince. That should bring him in, right? Uh, I've been doing this a lot lately. Is this on now? Is this, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, can I just tell you my life is amazing and wonderful? Like, I just want to start there. Um, this year, Ellsworth Centennial has been in the works for about probably since Ellsworth died. Uh, we always did amazing birthdays for Ellsworth on the fives. Uh, artists hate birthdays. What artists love are exhibitions. So that's what we did for Ellsworth's 100th birthday. We have major exhibitions around the United States and around the world. Uh, I am so pleased that there are so many people and so many museums that have been involved in the centennial of Ellsworth's birth, um, including the Museum of Modern Art, which actually gave him his birthday party on his 100th birthday, which would have been May 31st, um, 2023. I've been traveling around a lot, so I've been talking to a lot of people. And I'm really honored to be here, but I'm mostly honored to be here because of Gemini, which growing up in Los Angeles was one of the important 
um, venues of art that I saw growing up in Los Angeles. Um, because I wasn't a collector and didn't buy art, I always had to go after the exhibitions were up of famous artists Jasper Johns and Albers and Rauschenberg and Lichtenstein, and they always had incredible giveaways. And I could never get them because I wasn't on their list and wasn't buying things. So I'd go in and I'd say, could I, could I just have, could I have that, that, that one thing you did with? And so um, I love going to Gemini. I love Sid from the very beginning and Stanley, who uh, I miss very much. I wish he was here right now. Um, but I also have to tell you that it was a place that nurtured me in a lot of ways. They opened up their hearts and saw a young person. Um, you know, I was in my teens when I would go to, uh, to Gemini, and uh, it was a special place. And um, Los Angeles was a special place at that time. Uh, you could actually meet artists. Uh, there were, the, the art world was so small at that point. Um, but I just want to say a little shout out, a shout out to everybody here on the panel, uh, including Jim Reed, one of the incredible printers at Gemini that Ellsworth worked with, and some, some, Samantha Freeman, who is um, a joy to know and work with at the Museum of Modern Art. And what, what's your name? What, what's your name? Uh, oh, Jordan Schnitzer, uh, who has to be the Prince of Prince because um, what he's done for the field of Prince is amazing. And I'm sure that's been used before, but sorry. Um, it's, it's a little dad joke, but, um, and um, you're gonna do, Judy, no, I was gonna say, you're not, you're giving, you're not, you don't count. No, you're, you're the moderator. And Judy Hacker from the Prince Center. Um, thank you very much for listening to me. Um, and, whoa, that was nice. I love that suspended clap. Uh, uh, I just miss Ellsworth, and I wish he was here to experience this. Hi there. Um, first of all, it's impossible to follow Jack for anything. Um, sure. Um, I, I just have to say something about Jack. Um, there's no better steward for Ellsworth Kelly's legacy than Jack. And you've done so much for the celebration, for the 100th celebration. And we owe so much gratitude. And um, it's been such a meaningful year to see how everything unfolds. And it's really been through your vision. And it's really, that's also why we're here today is that we're continuing in that conversation and celebrating Ellsworth legacy and how you're making that happen. So thank you. Um, so I was very lucky to know Ellsworth in, in different ways. Um, first, when I worked at Sotheby's, I knew his work and, and worked with his work. And then through Jordan, um, oh, there's, uh, I think, Jordan, you took that picture. Um, and then through Jordan, um, I was able to work with Ellsworth on Jordan's collection of Ellsworth's. And then finally, I had the opportunity to work with Ellsworth very later in his, his life to make a dress that went to the museum. So it was in different um, venues. But what I can say um, is that when I think about this panel today, it's very much in the spirit of a book that Jordan published called um, Letters to Ellsworth. And what's so special about that book, and many of the people who contributed to that book are here today, uh, Joni and Jim and Jordan um, and myself, were, were, and, and there are many others. And um, of course, it was all about learning and through Ellsworth, through his lens, learning not only about his art and learning how to see, but what I think really connects the book and what connects today is the very meaningful connections that Ellsworth made throughout his life. And so I have the great pleasure of introducing you to those people who have made such contributions to Ellsworth. Um, so your panelists for today are Samantha Friedman, who's further left. She's the associate curator at the Museum of Modern Art. And if you haven't seen, she's made so many incredible exhibitions. Certainly one that comes to mind is the George O'Keefe show that just happened, the works on paper. Extraordinary. Um, yes, yes. 
and if you didn't see it, she brought together so many important works, and it's so connected to printmaking because you got to see how she made drawings in serial form, and, and so many of the drawings related to each other. And then, of course, you, I, this is an endorsement. You need to run over to MoMA now and see her current show, which is with the foundation, and it is the Ellsworth Kelly sketchbooks. I think this is the second iteration of that. And it's such an intimate view of understanding Ellsworth and his process, and it's exquisite. So please go run and do that. Um, our next panelist, and I want to acknowledge that Jim came in all the way from LA for this talk. And I would also suggest that he should have his own panel because he has such a wealth of knowledge. He was at Gemini Gel for 36 years. He started in uh, um, 1990, uh, 80, uh, excuse me, uh, excuse me, it was 1979, my math is not very good today. Um, and he um, retired in 2015, but he had a lifelong career at Gemini, and of course his relationships and his commitment to working with Ellsworth, he has so much valuable information that I can't wait to hear today about what that process was like. So thank you so much. You're just amazing. Um, and then, of course, Jordan needs no introduction, but I'm more than happy to give you a very small slither. So Jordan Schitzer, as you know, is the founder of the Jordan Schitzer Family Foundation, which he founded in 1997, which I was there for that. And he, um, through his personal collection and through the foundation's collection, over the years has amassed an astounding collection. Uh, it's over 22,000 works, and I can attest it grows day by day. And what he does with this work is so meaningful because his outreach is for arts and for um, supporting education and to children. And so he lends his work to museums, to everyone who needs it, to share um, in that kind of experience. And the numbers of museums that he reaches is so far, I think it's a staggering, I think it's um, 120 museums, and he's had about 160 shows. So it's, it's really work that is so impressive, and I'm, I'm very proud that I've, I've been associated with that. And of course, with Ellsworth Kelly, he, um, his collection was the basis for the 2012 exhibition that was at the LA County Museum, which was the opening space for the Renzo Piano uh, Pavilion. Um, he also, as you can see over there, generously supported the most magnificent two-volume catalog raisonné of Ellsworth Kelly's work. It is the benchmark for catalog raisonnés and um, of, well, of prints, thank you, of the prints. And, um, and then also, as I mentioned before, um, Letters to Ellsworth, which is just my favorite book because it is such a personal um, exploration and getting to know all the people that were meaningful to Ellsworth and that were impacted by him. So you are, Judy might pretend that she's in the background, but she's not, she's in the foreground. So Judy Hecker, who as you know, is head of the New York, um, the Print Center in New York, and she's been doing that since 2016. And if you haven't gone over to see her new space, which is in the same building as Joni's, it is incredible. It's a game changer now for, um, for the block, for, and for printmaking, because being on the ground floor, she now has such a larger audience, and also the level of the quality of the exhibitions that you're doing is just like bar none. So I'm so proud that that is there. And prior to that, she was at the Museum of Modern and Art. She was a curator um, in 2000, was it 16? I think so, 16. And we knew, we grew up in the art world and knew each other there. So you're in for a real treat. Let's celebrate Ellsworth. <laughs> Thank you. Is this on? Yeah. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, Joni, um, for those great introductions. We're going to get right into it. I just want to say we adore being your downstairs neighbor. Um, we want to thank the Ellsworth Kelly Foundation for supporting this and our installation that's on in our lobby. Um, thank you all for traveling out and being here. We have an interesting um, three different slices, very personal slices. Um, about Ellsworth Kelly's life and work. Um, Samantha Friedman is going to kick us off with a, um, a close look at very personal, intimate sketchbooks that informed um, a lot of Ellsworth's practice and remained uh, private for 
most or all of his career. Um, so she'll launch us off with that intimate look. We're going to then um, speak with Jim and get a sense of what it was like to work in the workshop for 39 years, what, 35 years, um, 36, 36, I believe Jordan, um, working side by side with him. Um, so we're excited to take that intimate look and then get a sense from Jordan about his very special relationship as a collector, as a philanthropist, um, who has, I think, almost every print um, created by Ellsworth and is uh, Sharon already mentioned, has done so much more as part of that project. So I'm going to hand uh, the proverbial mic, you've got one, over to Samantha. We're going to, we have great visuals accompanying all of this. We'll go for about 30, 35 minutes and then open it up uh, to questions and discussions from so many of you in the audience um, who know the work so well also. So welcome. Thank you so much, um, everyone, for all of those wonderful introductions. And I'm really excited to dive in um, to a look at Ellsworth Kelly's sketchbooks. And if it seems perverse to start a conversation about Ellsworth Kelly's prints by looking at sketchbooks, it's actually quite fitting because it's actually where a lot of the ideas for Kelly's prints and so many of his works in all mediums began. Um, so this is a look at the current gallery um, on MoMA's fourth floor devoted to Ellsworth Kelly's sketchbooks that opened in honor of the centennial um, and which continues to be on view today. Um, as Sharon mentioned in its second iteration, we paper people of course are turning the pages as needed. Um, and um, this gallery is really a tribute to an extraordinary and transformative gift um, that we received in 2020 from Jack. Um, of 25 of Ellsworth's sketchbooks. And these um, amazing works, uh, which encompass uh, some 40 years, some 1,700 pages, um, are so extraordinary because they help us see an artist who so often is, um, whose work is seen as being, I, lo I love to use that, that Matissean phrase, apparently simple, right? Um, but of course not at all. And we see so much the um, experimentation, the labor, um, the thinking, um, the humanity, this real intimate view of a, of a person as much as an artist working things through um, in, in the sketchbooks. And so these are just a few of the bird's eye views of the sketchbooks in those cases, but of course they contain uh, multitudes and um, so the sketchbooks help us see a number of things about Ellsworth's practice. So we see in them him working through and experimenting with different strategies, right? So encountering the, the French school children's papier gommette um, and cutting it up into little squares and um, rearranging those squares and then extrapolating that into larger works. And so what we're able to do in this gallery is really see how those strategies begin in a sketchbook and then expand and play out into larger works, um, whether on paper or otherwise. Um, we see in the sketchbooks um, the play with particular motifs, the development of specific motifs. So the kind of negative and positive space, um, the pair of curves that would eventually result in the Brooklyn Bridge paintings, um, but which were actually based on um, a detail of a sneaker um, being um, thought through in different ways in I think what is my favorite of the sketchbook, sketchbook number 27. Um, it's a very good one. Um, and. Um, and then we also see um, the experimentation and the trying and the testing of different possibilities, right? That's what's, I think, one of the things that's so moving about the sketchbooks is the sense of possibility. So many things that were realized in different mediums and so many things that didn't have a chance to be realized or were realized in a different way. Um, and so I love this page um, from another sketchbook from New York in the mid 50s, where you see this, this big black form that would come to be the painting barge, um, but you see multiple possibilities um, of what it might have been or where it started. So if you look on the bottom, um, you can see how first there's a yellow form and a red form that are kind of hovering quite close to each other. You see those two forms fuse now in green and blue right next 
next to it, and then you see that fused set of two forms in two different colors um, end up as the black form on top that would um, result in the painting. And this is where I think we see such a close connection between what's going on in the sketchbooks and what's going on in some of the print series, right? That you don't have to choose. He didn't have to choose a single answer or a single final version, but you might be able to explore the same form in multiple colors or in different um, iterations throughout the arc of that series. And so um, I'll take us to um, and, um, an example that Richard Axum illustrates in the beautiful essay that's in this tome that I'm resting my notes on, um, where you see another set of examples from, again, that amazing sketchbook 27, um, where you see this found piece of metallic paper, which I always think about as a kind of a Willy Wonka golden ticket. Um, and then it, it appears again in that same sketchbook as a kind of a green paper collage, um, and then shows up a decade later um, in his um, series of 27 lithographs with Mog. And um, it's a reminder that the work going on in the sketchbooks isn't always simultaneous to the print project or the other project of, of any kind with which it might relate. That these are really storehouses for motifs, for ideas, and they could show up at any time. So we have a decade of distance um, between this moment, but we do have wonderful examples in the sketchbooks in MoMA's collection where we see that work happening simultaneously in real time. And um, that's the case, um, this is the title page um, of um, Sketchbook 51, where you see he's really explicitly described it as um, being um, work for the Mog lithographs, the first of these two series he made um, with Mog in the mid 60s. Um, and you see him working through all aspects of the project in this sketchbook. Um, so you see really the start of the development of the forms um, that will run through um, that series you see experimentation with color. Is it blue and red? Is it red and blue? Um, how can we lend color to these forms in what order and what arrangements? Um, and then starting to think through the kind of rhythm or arc of the compositions of different forms across the project and how do they relate to each other. And then even really getting into the nitty gritty. So hopefully uh, you can see this detail that I've blown up where we see that arrow form. Um, and then we see his note about um, that work being in orange and blue um, in this particular instance. And so that's the same, um, we get the same kind of window um, into the um, suite of plant lithographs, which directly follow um, that project, also with Mog, um, in this sketchbook. I'm just trying to give you a sense of the materiality of them with some of these images, because they are such material objects and not at all like isolated images. Um, and so, um, while some of the um, lithographs from this series were made directly onto the transfer paper, many of them were done first as drawings in the sketchbook. And um, so this is the, the string bean plant that um, Kelly drew in his sketchbook on site at M.A. Mogg's farm in the south of France, but then importantly felt um, that he wanted very quickly to go inside and draw it again on the transfer paper. So they look identical when you first see them, but if you look really closely, you'll notice subtle differences in the forms. And then of course in the translation to print, you also see a difference in scale, you see the sighting on the sheet um, with more white around it. Um, and you see a difference in the quality of line between pencil and that greasy um, crayon um, that results. But I think um, Ellsworth really wanted to maintain the what he called the intensity of his perception um, from that first moment of drawing on site to then um, redrawing it on the transfer paper um, and it resulting in print. And then finally, oh, oh, sorry, this is just another example also from that same sketchbook of the pair of pairs um, from the same suite. And then um, finally, I just wanted to end on the first um, print project Ellsworth did with Gemini. Um, and we see a close look at it in um, this sketchbook 
where, um, as with so many of his works, we see him kind of focusing on the rudiments here in the sketchbook of line and form. And then as we move through to another page in the sketchbook focusing on color, um, and in this case, volume. And one thing that I love is that in the sketchbooks, you see that really idiosyncratic application of color that comes from using a felt tip pen, which of course, once it gets translated to print, becomes that ideal, flat, even, tone that Ellsworth always wanted to um, remove the personality from the work, right? And I think in a print like this, you see that happen in an almost magical way from the translation from sketchbook um, over to print. So hopefully leaving it with that first Gemini project is a nice transition over to Jim um, to take it from there. Fantastic. Um, I'll take this back. Thank you so much, Samantha. It really is so insightful to see these books, and I encourage all of you to go to MoMA and look at them um, in context of other works from the collection. So thank you so much. Um, now we're going to take you a little bit into, a little back in time, and into Gemini's uh, workshop in LA. And this is Jim uh, in the studio. Uh, he began working there in, in 1979 and, and, and through 2015, and thank you for letting us drag you out of retirement um, and back in time a little bit. Um, Jim and I have had a, a couple of conversations over the phone, and it's great to have you here. Um, we've had a little bit of a debate because Jim feels, um, I think his, his focus was really on the technical and the craftsmanship and not on the content. And in many ways, that's right. Um, the content was left to the artist and to it for everyone else to interpret. But in many ways, with printmaking, uh, the technique and the process, and even just the space and environment of the workshop drives the content. And um, Jim, from the stories that you've told me, you've been a problem solver. Um, you've made errors that Ellsworth then turned into new projects. Um, there were ahas at 3 a.m. that you would then have to deal with the next day. Uh, and I'd love for you to comment on that and then we can get into particular works. And also comment on your first encounter with Ellsworth Kelly's work when you were 14 years old in Seattle. And that was really your first kind of foray into art. And then 15, later, 15 years later, 19 years later, or so you ended up um, at Gemini and working with Ellsworth. So um, tell us about that and tell us about a little bit about life and, and the collaboration in the studio. Well, thank you, Samantha, for um, pointing out the other side of the work. Um, I, I think it was, to some extent, it was a, um, uh, an unwritten rule that we didn't ask the artist what their work was all about in the first place. And so for me, it was a technical approach always, and collaboration, um, the excitement of collaboration, it was always a new challenge. You'd have to build new tools to make the work happen. Um, it was always something new. Uh, but in the very beginning, I first uh, saw Ellsworth's work when I was uh, 14 years old. Um, I, my father had taken me down to the Seattle World's Fair in 1962 and we were walking around and we walked into one gallery and there was um, Ellsworth's paintings on one wall and Jasper John's paintings on the other wall. And my experience up to that date was um, uh, geese flying in the sky, that's what art was. And I, I just stood kind of totally unaware of what I was looking at. And my father came to get me and said, let's go to the next room. And I'm saying, no, no, I'm going to stay for a bit. And, you know, it was, it, it, it really engaged me. I, I, I couldn't tell you what I saw, but it, it interested me a lot. And, uh, I mean, it was so strange to think that, you know, 15 or so years later, I would actually be working with him and got to work with him for the better part of 35 years. So, um, um, where am I going with that? We can get into some of, I think the other yes. thing that you had said that was really interesting to me is how textured you, you felt um, right. Ellsworth's paintings were and right. how some of that was often overlooked and in fact how 
in addition to color, and you really see that in the Gemini show, um, texture became something that uh, he explored um, to a great degree in printmaking. And so maybe you could tell us a little bit about that um, through this triptych, um, St. Martin's triptych, um, where um, Ellsworth had a, a long history of, um, with St. Martin's and, and works related to um, that subject. Uh, but in particular, this triptych um, is where he started to move with you into um, mylars, right, and photo positives, where things were scaled up. No, not at that point. Not at that point. This, okay. This, this is uh, the first project that we did any kind of texture work was um, this uh, St. Martin's, um, and the work was uh, was a traditional way where where he would draw a touche material, water water touche material, onto uh, an aluminum plate, and that would be dried and and that would be printed. But in this case, um, he painted a textural image. Um, as you see in the backgrounds here, and they were fairly loosely um, laid out. It wasn't a firm rectangular shape. Um, and once that textural plate was done, uh, they were printed, and um, because it was on a ball grain plate, it would be a mirror image of what he had actually drawn. Uh, in, in, in the... In the from that point on, these prints were printed, and then there was a second version of the prints where the um, mask was cut out of the out of paper and laid on top of the uh, full textural drawing to identify just the image itself. Um, I think one of the, the side stories on this that was a horror at the time, but turned out to be kind of funny, was um, we had laid the plates down into another studio to dry, and uh, I walked in and saw that there was a footprint on one of them. And, uh, and we've got an image of that here um, <laughs> with Sydney. It's uh, on the right side of the print where its right hand is. You can see the footprint about a third the way down the yeah, composition right. Yeah, right. on the straight. <laughs> there you go. Thanks, That's Jack. That, Thank you, Jack. <laughs> it's, and so it was interesting because we all panicked and we felt horrible. And uh, uh, Ellsworth came over and said, who did this? And we're all like looking at our shoes and saying, oh my God, I'm glad it's not mine. And eventually, uh, Ellsworth uh, discovered that it was his footprint. And so he said, well, that's okay, we'll go with it then. And so that's, uh, that was sort of a fun accident that came out of that project. Um, but for, this was in um, uh, 1984. Uh, was the first project that I had ever done with him with any kind of textural surface. Uh, and then in 1988, um, we did another project, but by then, the, um, um, the printing matrixes had changed. We were now able to use a, uh, a photo plate uh, so the artist could draw directly onto a piece of mylar, and then we would turn that over face down, shoot the plates, and then that would be um, printed again in uh, correct reading. Um, and on this particular project, um, you can see on the bottom one, there's the textural image. <clears throat> the middle one has, uh, I think the middle one is uh, just the solid flat. So those are two separate plates. The, uh, the, the, the um, matrix that was used to make the middle print was a, a ruby lith hand cut to uh, use as a mask where on the previous project we would have to do a cutout to lay a paper on top this the actual printing plate was the image exactly and and then we would take uh, the textural drawing that he had done on mylar expose that and then use that same ruby lith again so we would burn off everything except the actual textural image then those two would be printed together, which is the top print. It has two separate printings on it. And there were quite a few prints in that we, we from that point on, that was how we did a lot of uh, the textural prints. And the other thing that you, you can't tell from the reproduction, but these are really, really large. This is seven feet wide, yeah. uh, this series of prints. And things started to get really big at that time right. um, in the workshop. And... Um, 
and a lot of horizontality in particular. Maybe you could walk us through um, this series on top um, from 1987-88, purple, red, gray, orange series, and then um, the single sheet that came afterwards from 1988. Uh, so tell yeah. us about this story. Yes, this, these prints were done the same way. It was um, a photo plate, um, a drawing, uh, textural drawing on mylar, and then a flat plate. And so this particular project had, um, there were uh, prints that were the combination of the texture and the flat, and then there were separate states of just the texture by themselves and just the um, solids by themselves. So it, it got to a point where there was a lot more um, exploration that was going on and and um, I, I'll have to admit that the, the one of the greatest joys of working with Ellsworth is trying to solve the problems that he brought for us and uh, and like I had said earlier uh, the uh, uh, it was those aha moments where you at three o'clock in the morning you go how are we possibly going to solve this problem and it, it, it's phenomenal, they would just come up. Like the particular curves that would be on these larger prints, we had to make a very large compass to be able to cut the curve. Um, sometimes they were like an eight foot long uh, piece of two by four that we'd put a, <laughs> an X-Acto knife on the front so we could get a nice clean cut. Um, and it, it, we were looking at uh, four of the prints um, in the artist's studio, and it was too tight, so Ellsworth said, well, can we go upstairs and look in the gallery? And I put the four prints up there on the gallery, and he walked in and said, yeah, this is great. This is exactly what I want. And, I'm, and he said, we'll do it on one piece of paper. <laughs> and I, you know, a foolish young fellow who is afraid to say no and uh, bragging that I could pull it off, uh, we ended up doing those four ele elements that we previously saw all on one single sheet of paper. And you know, he, he had said, can we do it? And I said, oh yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, little did I know, it was just a nightmare. <laughs> um, and ended up being a very small edition. Um, but it was, I mean, it's difficult to print one perfect print of Ellsworth's work um, and do a full edition. But when you have to do four of them on the same piece of paper, it, it, it was exhausting. So it, it was, um, it was pretty exciting to be able to pull that off. <laughs> Let's talk about um, the texture now a little bit that these, the, the, mm -hmm. they're Nick and um, black and, and black texture and the really interesting ways that these came about. Um, here's a close up of one of them and they're really just spectacular. Um, and I'm gonna actually well, tell us, yeah, tell us about this, okay, this project and then the evolution, and we've got some more images okay. about, um, and I'll give you a sneak peek here, um, how the next project came about um, through off-prints right. right. and proofs that were cut up and used as note cards by Gemini, and they right. still do this, and right. you see them all over, yep. um, such as this. So this so. particular project, um, we started the... the, the the texture in the bottom image has uh, four separate uh, plates. And, um, uh, and then there's a flat that goes on top uh, as, as the top shape is. But um, and as you mentioned, uh, there often when we did an edition, there were a lot of reject prints that just were not acceptable. And Sydney would often cut those down as note cards and send them sometimes to the artists. And uh, Ellsworth picked out four of those, and that's where uh, the next print uh, you can see on the uh, on the image on the on the left there. Um, we had to go back to the first print and determine where these little postcards had come from, and then we had to go back and get an image, and then have it photographed and enlarged to be. I think they were like uh, 20 by 40 or something in that range. Um, and each of them had two separate plates that made that field up. So, uh, and those were made by two different exposures. So in changing the exposure, 
you get a very high contrast or a full tonal image. Um, so we had to find all four of these uh, twice and then put them all back together again. Um, it, again, a very big challenge. Um, and, you know, again, the challenge is, is the most fun of collaboration. And then this became, those became the basis of all the river right. body of work. Um, and you see here on, um, on the left, a, a four panel, the river from 2003, and then separate um, panels that came out of that same process, the Rhine, the Amazon, the Yangtze, the Sin. I think there were 13 or 15 uh, there, yes. in all. I don't know the exact number either, but there's four panels there, and then there's two for each one. So eight. that would be eight, yeah. Um, and that would be uh, like the, the, the image that was originally um, selected from the print and was a, a, a note card that, that he received. Uh, that had to be broken down into two plates. So overall, we had eight plates from those four images. And then those were blown up. And then after the edition was printed, then we um, took just the single plates themselves and printed those as individuals. And that's where the, the rivers came from. And then there was some more experimentation. This is River 2, where it was one printing of the river stacked on another printing right. of the river. So it sort of continued to that's, there, evolve, right? There's, there's always um, creative accidents, let's say. Uh, on this particular image, they were um, we had tried two different printing sessions, and um, the top image and the bottom image, image you can see that the, uh, the bottom image on the lower right is uh, upside down or reversed from the one um, on the other side here. <laughs> so these are the same, yeah. and this one upside down. Oh yeah, that's it's the other way around, right. Um, <clears throat> when they were being printed, uh, there was a mistake made, and that end panel got printed upside down. And um, Ellsworth noticed it and thought that was brilliant. So that instead of being a four panel print, it became a much bigger eight panel print. <laughs> so, it, it, I mean, the scale just always exploded with Ellsworth. It was, uh, it, he, he would always push the limits and we always tried to satisfy him. I hope we did. This was uh, another image here where we did these massive big color fields. And as you move along in, in the technique, um, you also have to come up with solving all the problems. So these large fields of ink required a much larger roller, a much larger ink slab, because when you're printing a flat, you can only roll the roller over the image once. So the roller needs to have a bigger circumference than that image. Um, it got to a point where these large prints required a printer on each handle. I think uh, the print, print the, uh, uh, the rollers that we used on there, I think were uh, 42 or 43 inches wide, and it had um, a circumference of over 60 inches. So they weighed about 35 or 40 pounds. And even if you wanted to, you couldn't stretch out and roll your arms out 65 inches. <laughs> um, but that was the excitement of collaboration, because it was always pushing the limits. Can you do this? Oh, sure, yeah. And you'd go home and cry. And <laughs> hopefully, that 3 o'clock morning would uh, give you an answer, but not all the time. <laughs> but, um... Thank you, Jim. Thank you. <laughs> It was a great pleasure working with Ellsworth. I, I can't tell you how exciting it was. It was just from, from being a kid, seeing his first work and not understanding it to being able to help him create that work. And uh, I miss Ellsworth a lot. He was a tremendous person. Thank you. Well Wonderful to see those strong bonds and the memories flooding back. So thank you for sharing. Thank you. Thank you. Much and um, as we mentioned before, a lot of you can read more of what Jim has written and, and so many others in the letters 
to Ellsworth book, which really is about those bonds and, and a tribute. And one of those bonds um, I want to turn to now is, um, was between Ellsworth and, and Jordan Schnitzer. You spent time in his home and studio, um, and we have a series of very personal photographs that you yourself um, during those visits, and they focus on details like the way paintbrushes are laid out, shoes, eyeglasses on a desk, and uh, it was a very moving experience for you where you learned about the work but also about the artist and the man, and I would love for you to walk us through these photographs and, and tell us how that relationship evolved in the acquisition and then the exhibitions and ultimately the catalog resume applications. Well, first, let me, let me correct one thing that Jim is always so humble. And uh, the dozens of times when I would come down to Gemini and, and uh, Sid and Joni were always so wonderful and say, come on back and watch prints being made. And if you think about what we're talking about here, we're talking about paper, an artist, and a printer. And in this case, all I can tell you is it was a marriage made in his, the studio. And uh, the magic of watching him work and when they talk on the phone and do things was really in the lifetime of art relationships a very, very special one. So you're always very humble about what you did, but you had a masterful hand in taking the artistic genius of Ellsworth Kelly and creating all this for us. So really, thank you. Uh, how the, uh, how the, the, the books came about is that uh, I don't remember when I first saw Ellsworth Kelly's work. Like many of you, you can't remember it. You were young. But I always loved his work. When I started collecting prints in Ernst in 1988, I just started buying at the auction houses and some galleries uh, some of his work. And then I got a call from Matthew Marks. And he said he'd talk to, the, to Ellsworth, and Ellsworth was very impressed by what Dorothy Lichtenstein had said about the work I'd done with Roy Lichtenstein's work, a small book, and the exhibitions of his work. And Matthew asked, uh, said that Ellsworth would like to know if I would like to become the major repository of his works on paper. And I said, absolutely. Uh, next thing I know, I flew into Hudson Airport, and as I've said before, driving around up there at night uh, before the GPF, whatever, uh, all I'd see is every few miles a light. And I kept seeing all these signs, Rip Van Winkle Bridge, Rip Van Winkle Library, and I said, they got the story all wrong that we grew up with. He didn't fall asleep for 100 years. He got lost for 100 years. Uh, the next day, I did find my way to Spencertown, and uh, Ellsworth had put up in one of the galleries uh, eight or ten prints that he had framed, and I'd sent the list. He knew what I didn't have, and uh, it was a wonderful, magical day. Um, uh, especially because Jack prepared a fabulous lunch as he often did and so forth. So uh, the seminal moment was upstairs in the library. There's an image there of the us being library with Sharon Copeland Hurwitz and uh, we're across from each other and uh, there were a hundred prints he had that I did not have. I had about a hundred and uh, he asked which ones I wanted and I said all of them. He said really? I said you bet. And I said I've already talked to Rick Axum who'd done earlier work writing about Ellsworth and we'd love to do a new catalog raisonné, not realizing later that he wanted one page per image, and 850 pages later, uh, while it may be one of the best catalog raisonnés ever produced in the history of the world, it's a little heavy, but uh, anyway. Um, so that began that relationship, and, and uh, all I can say is that uh, I've never made a big deal about meeting artists, because I've always been worried that their work has meant so much to me, like I'm sure art that you all are lucky enough to have in your homes means so much to you. And I've never been much of a stargazer about Hollywood people or whatever, and I was always worried if I met some artist whose work I just uh, loved and they were just a jerk, I'd be so annoyed that why did you do this to me? I'd rather have not met you and just continued to put your work on the, the, the walls and pedestal that you are. Um, he was beyond a gentleman. and. Uh, more than that, it's often in my experience with him what I observed that he didn't say, and I guess the simple answer is that um, I've always said to be an artist at that level, you have to have a genetic predisposition to an aesthetic. In other words, uh, uh, some of us dress with more style than others. Uh, he just obviously was blessed with a, a sense of, of color and space and form and time. Uh, 
but at spending time with him at Spencertown, when he, we got in a golf cart to go to a, a little storage area he had, and just watching him look at grass, plants, whatever, I could just feel a power of observation that was far beyond mine. Maybe you all have wondered when you have friends that are doctors, whatever, when they look at people, do they suddenly see hearts, organs, or whatever? All I can tell you is when he'd look at things, you could see how that eye was so fully developed, uh, and it just made a big impression on me. So yes, we bought those works, and um, then started working with Rick Axum, that I think is probably the premier art writer in the country, We'd, and um, it was a joy working with him, and we were working on the uh, catalog raisonné. I will say about this, uh, I'd already done four or five books, we've now done 14, and the only argument or disagreement I ever had with him was uh, knowing in the art bookstores what sells and doesn't sell, Ellsworth wanted to do this very clean uh, fabric. I wanted to have more like a shiny cover so when it was on the bookshelves, people would see it. So finally, Jack called up, you remember this Jack? And he said, Jordan, look. Okay, this really means a lot to Ellsworth. This is the way he wants it done. But we have a compromise. We can do the gray, beautiful, pick the lettering and everything, and then we'll do a stick on, uh, an image on the top that peels off. So I suddenly thought there and said, here we have the probably greatest master colorist of the 20th century. Who am I to question his judgment about aesthetic? So we went with what he said, yes, sir. And uh, we published that. In the meantime, okay. In the meantime, I said to Jack, you know, why don't we do something special? His birthday was coming up. And um, so Jack worked with me in confidence, and uh, we reached out to a number of people I knew and some I didn't know to do this book, Letters to Ellsworth. And what this was was going to people who had known him and critics and friends and asked them to write, in essence, a tribute. And um, of the 14 books I've done, um, this is probably the most special in terms of it being the most intimate and in terms of, if one could say, a gift from someone that just put him and his work at the highest level, uh, a way to give back something to him. So we surprised him. Uh, Sid and Johnny, remember we had a dinner in L.A. the night before the opening at LACMA because when we talked about where to have the exhibition, I said, you know, G. Ellsworth, where do you think, whatever, we, we serve you in the museums, wherever you want. And he mentioned that Michael Govan, who just became the director at LACMA, had done his uh, thesis on prints and loved his work, and we called Michael, and he said, you bet. And it was a wonderful exhibition. So the night before the show opened up, we uh, had a, a dinner party for him, and we brought out a cake and then brought out the book, and he was sitting next to Frank Geary, and you were at that table, and Jack was there, and uh, I think he was very touched. And uh, I think Jack told me he kept the book very close to him uh, in his bedroom, whatever, and... Uh, and uh, Looking back, I think it was a wonderful way for so many people who he meant so much to, to tell him that in writing uh, instead of at a eulogy. <laughs> uh, so this was a, a special book. Uh, Joni has a bunch of them at the, uh, at the, the Gemini GEL and a very special. Um, so it was a, a la labor of love and uh, um, just it was a, a, a special uh, relationship and and uh, Jack and I became friends, and as was said earlier, and Jack's done, I think he'd be so proud of how you have dealt with his legacy in an appropriate, uh, uh, with integrity, and, uh, and just done a heck of a job. And uh, uh, so this was a wonderful um, part of my art life. Thank you. Thank you, Jordan, so much. We have a uh, rare that you um, have a curator, a collector, and a printer in particular on stage. We'd love to open it up for any questions or comments. Um, you know, let, me, let, let me tell you one other story that's interesting, especially as we're talking about prints here. I called him up about something, I forget what it was, and I said, now, Ellsworth, I don't want you to get mad at me, but your paintings are fabulous. My gosh. Your sculptures, oh, those totems in his backyard and the other things they've done, incredible. On the other hand, <laughs> I think the best work you've done is the work on paper, okay? And he went on to uh, 
give me a lecture about how he stayed true to his brand, call it, to his images when he was getting a lot of, I think, collegial flack from Liechtenstein, uh, Russian, I mean, his peers who were doing far different work. And uh, I wish I'd taped it and we could play it today. But I truly think, uh, and I'm fortunate now to have bought a painting that I'm still paying for, and uh, of course his sculpture, but I think if there was an artist that was, was, was born to this medium, it was Ellsworth Kelly. And uh, that's not to say the paintings and the sculpture aren't spectacular. And the fact that he devoted so much of his time and work so that from that democratization of art that Warhol pushed, so lots of people could have his work and enjoy it, uh, is a real also testament to him. Because he could have done more paintings and less prints, and then less of us would have that work to share. So uh, uh, quite, a, quite a legacy on, on works on paper. Do we have any questions? Uh, I have one, and the panelists might have questions for one another. And this might be better for Jim, for Jack, for Joni, for Sydney. Did the sketchbooks enter into the print workshop? There were some sketches that he would do when he was laying out basically dimensions of the pieces and the orientation of the pieces. But um, other than that, I, I don't remember. I mean, I, I think one of the best books out there is, uh, I think it's called Tablets. And it's um, basically the origin of a lot of his work. And I, if you're at all interested, I think it's a great, a great uh, piece of information. Tablet uh, was a group of works that um, Ellsworth continually sketched from night till day, uh, doodled, uh, and had boxes full of little scraps of paper. If you actually see some of the sketchbooks, there are, are pieces cut out of the sketchbooks that no one knows where they are, and they're probably in these um, uh, set 14 by 17, I think, they're similar to that, but I don't know, some kind of, uh, but he pasted on similar kinds of ideas from these little scraps of paper that he had. And it was bought by the Manil uh, and shown at the drawing center, uh, the complete set. So um, it is a pretty great uh, repository of his work. I, can I just say one thing uh, about Ellsworth and transfer uh, and his, his use of transfer paper? Um, Jasper Johns and Ellsworth, uh, Jasper had a place down in St. Martin. Uh, we had friends down in St. Martin. We used, we used to go to St. Martin for holidays. Uh, Ells Ellsworth and Jasper had this continuing debate about the idea of lithography. And Ellsworth said, when I draw a line like this, I want to draw the line. I don't want to do it backwards. This is, this is how I want to draw the line. And, and, and Jasper would say, well, that's not lithography. You have, to sh you have to do it on a plate, and it has to be with a mirror and backwards. And, um, and so they had this conversation every, every Christmas. I think they like, talked about what the right way uh, uh, to do lithography was. And uh, I just thought it was interesting what you were talking about earlier. And uh, ne neither way is wrong or neither way is right. One's more traditional, I suppose. Um, but it's backwards for Ellsworth, so. And one, one thing, when I was in his studio, here I was taking pictures of his desk, his shoes, his paintbrushes, because for me, that's the, the man behind the work. And he thought I was crazy, especially the shoes. I said, wait a sec. I said, I'm from the Northwest. Uh, Dale Chihuly, his shoes are always painted. And uh, I think now those images and the work, and especially the, 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 the scrapbooks, the, are, are such an important part of understanding when you want into that depth and level about him, about his work. He's still trying to buy the shoes. <laughs> Can I uh, throw in a quick segue here? Um, in, in, in referring to the images that are uh, uh, a mirror image that you see, uh, Sydney has a very wonderful photograph 
of uh, James Rosenquist um, doing a drawing, and he's got the image he wants um, taped to his chest, and he's holding a mirror. <laughs> well done, Sydney. <laughs> and then drawing on the plate. Yeah. Any questions out there? If not, we'll invite you um, to see some of these prints in person uh, on 24th Street at Gemini, which is an extraordinary um, expose about uh, what happens with different colors, the same color in many different ways. Um, yellow is not just yellow. There are a thousand yellows. Um, and that exhibition is in view now um, until mid-November. Just downstairs at Print Center at 535 West 24th, we have examples by other publishers. Gemini was the biggest um, and longest relationship, but of course, Ellsworth also collaborated um, with Gallery Mog uh, in France and with Ken Tyler, and we have some extraordinary examples um, of paper pulp and uh, other works that he did, uh, the botanicals, uh, just downstairs. Um, but thank you all for coming, and thank you all for being here, and thank you all.